recorded live. Welcome to the virtual Virtualization Security Roundtable podcast episode number oh, 62 or something like that. Yes, 62. We're going to be covering path security today. Our get- normal panelists are Eben Rodriguez, Michael Berman, and Hammer Prafuchandra, and they cannot be with us today, and hopefully they'll join us later. But you have myself, Edward Haletke, a.k.a. Techside Will in the VMware Communities Forum, and author of the book VMware vSphere and Virtual Infrastructure Security, Securing the Virtual Environment, which is available from Amazon. Our special guest this week is Krish, who is an industry analyst and blogger focusing on topics related to cloud computing and open source. He writes about these topics at cloudapp.com. And James Urquhart. Is Urquhart Hart or? Urquhart. But that's, uh, Urquhart. I'm so sorry. That's James all right. Urquhart. <laughs> who is the program manager for Cisco's OpenStack Contributions, author of the CNET blog, Network, CNET blog, Network blog, The Wisdom of the Clouds. Welcome, panelists. So this yeah. conversation started on Twitter, of all places. <laughs> Actually, kind of a lot of conversations start there, don't they? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> About platform as a service security and, the, and what platform as a service to, today is really a development environment. There's nothing more that it's being done for. Yes, I have a platform, but I need to develop the apps on it. And we're starting to talk about security, and we're mentioning the fact that, you know, your what security is there for these platforms as a service, whether it's OpenShift or Azure or, or VMware's Cloud Foundry, what security do we have there? So you guys have your own thoughts. I have mine. I, I know I, I, my Spot is more about the weaknesses in the model. Mm-hmm. And so hey. what, what do you think? Hey, James, do you want to start with this? Go ahead and start, Crush. Go ahead, Crush. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in my opinion, like um, um, I, I, we could neither say uh, the security in the cloud is uh, less than what we have in traditional uh, uh, computing model or more. So. I would say it all depends on uh, the user and how he, uh, the user goes about do, uh, managing their security. So I would say the first thing is like uh, uh, identify your security needs and then go about uh, talking to the provider about the kind of security they have and uh, uh, then go uh, go about putting your uh, uh, applications on it. The thing is um, uh, the fault also lies uh, with um, uh, the evangelists like like me like we are, we promote uh, path to be some uh, ma- some magic pill where you just throw in your code and everything happens magic automa- automatically. But uh, in my opinion, like um, uh, that's a wrong way to go about doing it. We should be more practical in uh, educating the developers about uh, some of the things they have to take take into account before they push their code there. Mm, I would. Mm, I would start with, uh, with this. Let's see where, where the conversation goes, and I'll offer my thoughts as we go back. Yeah, and I think that I think the other you know element to pay attention to here is there's a there's a whole spectrum of what can be called platform as a service, and you know in in my way of thinking about it, everything from sort of the collection of services as a platform that is something like Amazon Web Services, where you know it's it's not so much that there's a programming framework um but but that there's a set of services that you can use to you know to integrate an app into an application and to save you a lot of effort in terms of operations of core functions like data like compute and store you know and and object storage um and then the other the full opposite end of the spectrum is you know here's a very firmly defined framework for a certain class of applications that um you know you just write the code to that framework, and everything else gets taken care of for you. So something like where um, Google App Engine's been um, since it was launched, and really looking at um, what it will take to, um, you know, within that spectrum, you have to, you know, not only identify what Chris was saying, which is sort of say, well, what are your security requirements, and then what do you need? But the other element is to remember that. Um, the types of security that will be offered by a vendor will in part depend on what kind of pass they're offering. If they're offering a framework for web applications um, with, you know, with limited transaction times, they're going to, they're going to focus on the security needs of something that uses a lot of caching that perhaps uses, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, non-SQL 
uh, type database options and and you know and and maybe you know maybe doesn't push things all the way to the point where things are firmly locked down but gives you a tight enough security that you feel you can reasonably run a web business on their on their framework um, and on the other end of the coin you may be responsible for a lot more of the security when you're piecing pieces of stuff together um, and so it gives you a lot more options in what you can do but at the same time you're going to be much more responsible for the outcome of of anything that occurs so so really, when we're talking about past security, you know, one of the things you've got to look at first is what type of platform are we talking about? And each of those types of platforms, the markets that they're targeting and the, the price points that they're targeting and so on are going to dictate what the vendor is willing to do around security and also what options you have on the table for you to further secure your application. So in a lot of ways, what we're talking about is the, the vendor – that may be defining what it is. I mean, let's take a look at Amazon Web Services for a second. And I just, I'll, you guys will be unmuted soon. The Amazon Web Services is a rather intriguing aspect because you're not, you're, while you're using their platform, all the programming is over, your, over their SOAP APIs. So a lot of the security that you have to deal with is transport security. So, I mean, and with their S3 offering, it's not only transported, but it's data storage, because you're actually data storing data up there, right? Right. So when I look at things like that, it's like, okay, well, what do I have to do from a secure coding perspective? Okay, what data am I going to store? How sensitive is that data? These are things I'm going to have to know before I even start writing an application to Amazon Web Services. Interesting. Right. I think that's exactly right. And, and, and that's why, you know, the... The idea that that there will be a universally secure platform um, is is very much a pipe dream unless you nail down things to such a point where you have a very limited you know architecture that you can choose for your application. So, but, that, but that's what all that's what PASS provides is a very limited architecture. Well, but but I, I, the argument would be as you're choosing what you're doing. You have a choice about which of those architects you, architectures you select. Once you select a platform environment, then absolutely your options on the table are in terms of both what kinds of applications or you can build, and the work that you have to do or don't have to do in order to secure that application to your requirements um, is uh, is narrowed down for you, right? I mean, at that point in time, you have some choices that have been made. That's part of the the trade off of past. You. You don't have to do as much work, but you don't have to do as much work because a lot of hard choices have been made for you um, up front. a fair amount of work still, and, and that's because, I mean, it is it, regardless of how you're doing it, programming of anything can be considered a lot of work. Do I have mm -hmm. to worry about the operating system? Probably not. But do, when I program today, do I have to worry about the operating system? Uh, nope. I've got somebody else to do that for me, right? Oh. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And not only that, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, as a programmer, I get faced with two types of programmers. Ones that are, okay, they'll, they'll go by the rules and say, you know, I don't have a problem with that. Just tell me what I need to do to be able to program. Just provide me the tools, a la a, an ID of some form like Eclipse. Provide me my user account, and I'm happy. On the other hand, yeah. I've dealt with other programmers who are basically saying, if I don't have root access, I can't, do, I can't program this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, uh, also with the first kind of programmers, uh, I would say that uh, uh, even though like uh, they have everything ready available for them to just push their code and uh, get it working, it's important that they, they, they understand what the provider is offering them. They need to really uh, look beyond the application framework and understand what are the practices the provider has employed. And things like that. For example, I'll say uh, PHP Fog is a very good example. It recently got hacked. They they offer a dedicated instance for each uh, each application. So if you just say, oh, okay, I have a dedicated instance and I'm you know, good to go, uh, there, there's a problem because the failover they had was a shared hosting environment, and like uh, the hackers got into the their system through the uh, shared hosting environment. So as a developer, even the first uh, kind of developers where you don't worry about anything, you just want you just want to push your code and uh, wait for it to wait for the magic to happen. It's important that you understand what is in store with the provider and really you make plans to um, work around any any of the any 
of the problems, the potential problems that may arise from their uh, uh, practices. Okay. Yeah. So I see, go on, who's next? This is Michael. Hey, Michael, go ahead, join in. All right. So, I mean, when you think about this, it, it, in a past solution, uh, I'm just going to just lay out my premise for my, my point. So, if in a past solution, they're taking responsibility um, minimally, at least for the operating system, and perhaps some of the application platform itself. You know, it could be um, some sort of SQL that's being made available, right? Or, or other, you know, what I'll say, core application infrastructure that is then built upon, you know, built upon by their their clients. Um, and then below that, they've got the other elements of the infrastructure. You know, nowadays uh, it may be virtual, it may not, but it typically is virtual. And there's computer and networking fabric, and then the physical data centers themselves. And so the customers are still having to build their software or deploy their software or port their software to the past solution, right? But with respect to what you were just saying before, it the customer is not going to have to do as much operating system work as they did because in, in, in implicitly they're handing off that to the past provider. You know, the past provider is now responsible, you know, if it's a Windows system or a Linux system, I think then becomes very interesting questions like, you know, what is the patch level? How are patches applied? If uh, uh, a new security vulnerable vulnerability is discovered against one of the past elements maintained by the provider, you know, when does the, is there an SLA? Or does the provider, you know, only patch when a, you know, when they feel? You know, you know, what I'm saying there's like a lot of questions that come to my mind here about this. And then there's the intrinsic issues if we're dealing with sensitive data or regulated data of any kind. How does a past customer get access to uh, provider layer reports? Right. Uh, I'll use PCI as an example because it's very concrete. You know, you have to do vulnerability scans of everything. Um, the customer in a past solution can only vulnerability scan their application. They may not be able to vulnerability scan the operating system or other layers in the past infrastructure, so therefore the provider has to do that. Is the provider making those vulnerability reports available to uh, their subscribers? Because if they're not, those, those subscribers can't pass a PCI audit, for instance. Right, and I think that's clearly about cloud audit. I mean, the yeah, ability right. to do that. And yeah. it still has to be done regardless. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the critical things here that that is really different, right? So when you talk about the operation of an app application end to end, and a lot of compliance, right, is 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 an operations concern um, in addition to a development concern. But when you talk about the ap actual operation side, now you're splitting responsibilities between those that operate the infrastructure, um, um, arguably those that operate the service itself that's running on the infrastructure, and then those that that op are operating the application that is deployed to or built on, and, and, the, and the platform as a service world, uh, built um, on or deployed to the platform as a service um, element. And so this idea of, um, of splitting horizontally rather than vertically in terms of the elements that are involved is really going to trip up a lot of the assumptions that we've been working off um, in IT for, for quite some time. And that concept of the right level of transparency, the ability to make the information available with respect to your workloads and your environment without exposing information that makes other customers vulnerable is I think a major engineering effort that um, that every platform as a service provider has to sort of really begin to take on and really understand. So there's some information you can get, for instance, from Heroku about how it's running in the environment and you know what nodes it's using and so on. But if you look at where Amazon is today, they don't really give you any automated way of understanding the security of the Amazon platform. And I think the same goes really for, for what Google's doing as well, right? There's a an assumption of trust that gets thrown out there that for the purposes of compliance and the purposes of regulated elements is is it's just not enough. And so I look at things like cloud audit and and where I know um Chris Hoff and, and, and the others on that team would like to go with, with eventually beginning to take into account things like um, limited vulnerability scans that let you check the systems that you actually have workloads running on um and get information that, that is, you know, reasonably um, secure for the other tenants in that environment. Um, 
those those are hard problems to solve, and those are problems we have to build towards. And I think that that really means that the the security of a platform as a service environment, you know, it, it, it's the same as we have with compute. We have to kind of start start at the ground floor and work our way up. And and this is going to be a big effort by the industry to get to the point where we have that transparency, but in a secure enough fashion that uh, that we don't. We don't throw everybody. And you guys, you know, you guys, it's a it's a virtualization security problem from a compute perspective for sure. Um, so you guys know a lot of the problems I, I, already. I think, I think it's more than that. I think it's mm -hmm. actually a code a code security issue as well as a data security issue. Sure. Unlike production machines where I'm actually using production data and those are secured according to production rules. Developers don't care about the data they're using, but oftentimes it is actually a copy of what's in use in production. So if it's a sure. copy of what's used in production and the past platform is not secured properly, I may be putting up, for example, while I'm doing my development, I may not be encrypting quite yet, but I've got to manipulate the data. I may be showing up on S3 a bunch of PII. I could be putting into Cloud Foundry a bunch of personal identifiable information. I may be doing the same thing in OpenShift without even realizing it. I'm now making my data vulnerable. So the developers aren't trained on this. They n yeah. don't know that that's not what they should be doing. Yeah, right, nice. I think uh, we are still in the early stages, and I think uh, we need to uh, spend considerable amount of time educating the developers because uh, we are just giving them a black box and asking them to uh, uh, code for it. Like so, it's uh, time we educate uh, educate them to look into all these things and and wow. also probably make uh, make the providers understand that uh, they need uh, uh, they need uh, yeah, developers to trust them and for. The, for it's well, when I look at developers, but Chris, when I talk to developers, mm -hmm. they're not—they're basically saying security is somebody else's problem. Yeah, yeah, but uh, with the and, time, but it is their pro in a past environment. It yeah. is their problem. Well, well, wait, yeah, but, but that's problem, I mean, yeah. I think that's an important point. Security is somebody else's problem until it is their problem. If they eliminate a more traditional operations role, which was ultimately responsible for security by through perimeter security. Then, um, then you know, and, and they basically eliminate that role by saying, "Hey, we can deploy and operate our own applications, a la the, the Netflix story and other stories like that." Um, then, then it, it becomes their problem in the sense exactly. that they may actually be, you know, they may actually become legally culpable um, for for violations in security that nobody, there's nobody else within the company to point to that that could have you know avoided a given problem. So I see developers who are actually taking it somewhat seriously that they now have to be the ones who think about how data gets encrypted in place, how how data gets encrypted in transport. But I think they have limited knowledge of how to attack the problem. And and again, I think this is where the platform providers have to help the situation. But we're at such a beginning stage that we don't have a good picture of that right now. Yeah, the maturity just isn't there. I mean, you know, what I see most of the platform providers doing is making very aggressive security statements, with some exceptions. But most of them are making very aggressive security statements in their marketing. Uh, but then when you look at the contracts in the SLA, it's the exact opposite. Right, right? Exactly. There's, a, there's, a, there's a complete absence of any responsibility or liability for security or data, data security in particular. And right. unless you're looking at, I think the one exception is HIPAA, there is no shared liability between provider and subscriber in any of the other regulations. Right. Um, you know, in fact, PCI is pretty darn clear about it. You know, it's all on the, it's all on the subscriber. Uh, so if you're putting PAN data in the cloud, it's your liability uh, if that data is compromised, not the cloud provider's. Uh, that's very clear from PCI. So you know, it's except very, it's if, very. Except if you're in Europe, situation. it's the other way huh? around. What? If someone is a U.S. company that has credit card processors in Europe, I'll guarantee you those cloud credit card processors, those clouds that are doing that, are responsible. It's called privacy. Well, that's because of the European Privacy Act. That's a different. Yes. Yes, it's a different regulatory climate in the EU. Absolutely right. And, and that's another thing that comes. This all comes back to right, which is to say, um, the, not it's not just the compliance that hasn't caught up to the technology yet, but it, 
but the law itself ha- is really not close to having caught up to. I mean, we still have you know all the same Fourth Amendment questions that we had two years ago, three years ago, and um, and so I think that you know another element that comes into play with this is that the industry is going to have to begin to work closely with not only the, the compliance regulators, but but the but the government uh, entities and, and other regulatory bodies in terms of begin, beginning to make the adjustments that begin to answer the, some of these questions very, very cleanly from the letter of the law. Um, uh, but, but let's step back a second. I really don't want to talk. This, 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 compliance is one thing, and compliance is not security. We all know right, that right, security right, right. is not compliance. Let's talk about security. Right now we have pointed out that there is a data leak issue. There is an issue with the developers knowing how to program securely in that world. There is an issue with the underlying security of the, plat- the past platform. And does mean and, is there anything there else that we have to worry about? Are those there, is only three layers? With, uh, there is an issue with providers not being transparent. Uh, I think uh, that is something which we have to drum really hard because if uh, providers need to uh, get the trust of the developers, they have to be transparent. That is, uh, that's why the uh, initiatives like cloud audit are becoming important. Uh, but, but somehow, like uh, when people talk about uh, the responsibilities, they don't talk about the responsibility of the providers uh, in establishing the trust. That is something which I think we have to keep highlighting till they really uh, come forward and establish, establish some ways to give some access to what they are doing internally. So now we know that the so we are saying that the providers need to step up and provide us the data we need in, yeah. a, in a fashion that makes a whole lot more sense than the way they're doing it today. Yeah. I think that's that's quite right. And again, it, it, even with the, the security, there's a, there's a whole catching up to, you know, there's a whole catching up of, of you know, even the security technologies. But I, I think that what it comes down to is, you know, ultimately, in order to build that trust, you have to know what you can rely on from these providers. And as long as the providers have these terms of services that Mike mentioned earlier, which is essentially saying, "Hey, you know, you put your stuff on there, we'll be responsible for, um, you know, for the security of the hardware and and uh, the security of your your account information." But other than that, you're on your own. Um, those, and, and those kinds of terms of service essentially, basically, you know, are 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 really making platform as a service not any help in terms of of simplifying security and simplifying that that life. And I believe that, from a competitive advantage perspective, from a variety of other perspectives, that as the the, the law makes adjustments, then then the ability of um, of platform providers to make promises about the security of their platform will become easier to do. Because right now, I mean. You know, it, you might as well, you know, put it as the equivalent of medical malpractice. It's, it's, you know, the the, the rules aren't clearly stated about what you, um, what a provider can and cannot be liable for. So they're going to basically pull themselves, you know, excuse themselves of everything they possibly can. Well, in, in fact, they almost have to in the market. I mean, let's just think about the situation that they're in economically, right? Yeah. The, the, at least in North America, Edward. Let's just just for a moment, let's ignore the EU. As important as they are, you know, within North America. A provider does not have, you know, a legal or regulatory requirement, you know, except for very few exceptions, to do anything about security. Therefore, if they kind of make security ubiquitous in their cloud, which is what they really have to do in order to do it right, their costs are higher. Therefore, what they have to deliver as an end user cost to their subscriber will be higher. Therefore, they will lose. They will go out of business, right? The current cloud and cloud provider environment. It's commoditizing rapidly, and it's a race to the bottom, right, to be as cheap as possible. And that's our current cloud market as I see it. So there's no incentive. In fact, it's the opposite is true. There's, like, there's no incentive for a provider to really beef up their security. Uh, certainly for the big ones, there's none. We may see a rise of you know, what I would call specialist providers dealing with sensitive information you know, who serve particular markets. Uh, okay. But the general provider, there's just no incentive. It's so, like, are yeah. you seeing that yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. PaaS is more pre- would be more prevalent in the community clouds? No, I don't think it comes to that. I think you know, again, a, a, a really good points there about about the incentives because I think the other thing to remember is that 
application developers in the infrastructure service world are willing to make huge adjustments to their application architectures to uh, allow for scalability and, and reliability in an unreliable infrastructure um, context. And, I, and, I, and so one of the things that occurs to me in, in listening to sort of that analysis of what the incentive set is, is I think that in the general purpose pass environment, then what it, it what in parallel will happen is you know that a, a tremendous amount of the security will be willingly taken on by developers. Now, whether that makes you feel good or not, right, right, comfortable that that that's a good outcome or not, is a really big question. But but to the point that there's nobody else that's going to do the security for them, I believe that developers will say, okay, well, if somebody has to be responsible for this or the company gets in trouble, then I'd better figure out how I'm going to solve this problem. Well, I think you know different developers than I do. And there's different classes the way, of developers the way I as well. See developing is like, um, uh, as you said, uh, there might be specialized services that will come up, and eventually, the, um, uh, I think we'll have a more federated approach to uh, the marketplace than w w what we expect now. And also, uh, slowly, uh, it's thinking on people that uh, economic incentives not the only reason we are going to uh, cloud, and there are other uh, advantages that uh, that are more important than the economic incentive. So, like probably, like if there is a provider who offers um, the, the necessary security and ch charges a premium for it, I think there will be a market for it. I think that's where we will we'll eventually end up having a more refrigerated, fragmented marketplace. Okay. So, one of the more successful pass platforms that I've seen is Dreamforce from the, uh, from Salesforce. Well, you write your application to it. But you got VMforce, you got Dreamforce. Well, Dreamforce is our conference. You got VMforce and a um, just force.com, right? And You're talking about com, the, so. the Apex, the Apex environment, right? The Apex environment where mm -hmm. people write their applications, but what happens is, in order for them to test it, they're actually integrating at the database to what Salesforce provides as test data. So mm -hmm. Salesforce is probably providing some sanitized test data to test my application. Mm -hmm. And I can enter data, and I can remove data, and so forth, and like that. But hopefully, I'm sanitizing before I do it. Even though I have my own instance, I may actually be. You never know what's going to happen under the covers. They've never, certainly, have never told us. So that one's actually been fairly successful. So then you start looking at, you know, Google Apps. I mean, how many people are programming the Google Apps today? You know, to to App Engine, to App Engine, or Google? Google? To the the Google. Right, so Google, App Engine is the pass environment. Yeah, so their App Engine pass environment. So there's a lot of people programming to that. However, if I'm storing data up there, I need to be careful what type of data I'm storing. The same thing mm -hmm. for Amazon. Mm -hmm. and, and then you start looking at, so those are fairly specific to those particular environments. But when you start talking, at, talking about the general pass environment, like Cloud Foundry and OpenShift, now we have a totally different world. Well, I, and I think you're right, but I think the the problems are very similar in that if what you're providing is basically application middleware and maybe a database engine of some sort, then um I don't think it really matters very much whether it's a general purpose pass or or a you know a single vendor pass environment that there's some real shared responsibility. you know there's a shared problem, an overlapping problem in terms of the responsibility for that you're talking about. And I think you're right. I think the the end user ends up being responsible for what data they put out there and, and having to be in control. They end up being responsible for for not only what they integrate with, but how they integrate with, you know, external services of various sorts and, and how they send data back and forth between those. Um, how they connect back to internal data centers or to other cloud environments, and, and what kind of security happens at the at the wire level um, there. That all becomes very much, I think, their their issue today. Um, but the and, developer themselves may not be concerned about it. Remember, they got a job to do. They got a very limited time frame. Uh, again, I, they're I developing that, code in what we would consider five years ago prototyping languages. Well, but but I mean, I, I would counter and sort of say, I think if you went and talked to a Netflix developer, you'd find a very different culture than your standard enterprise developer. And and to Chris's point earlier, I think the the, the question is, um, to what extent do you get the developers to understand what their new responsibilities are in this new world, and 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 what what skills they have to bring to the table? Or, and the alternative is, what can the platform providers do? 
to give the you know the the company the the end user company assurance that um, there's a certain level of security that will always be there that their developers don't have to think about um, before they move forward. Um, which you know is kind of full circle to what we're talking about here, which is is there's there's an interplay between what the past vendor does and is allowed to do in order to provide security capability versus what um, what the end customer um, can and is forced to do in order to provide the, um, the, the total security that they require end to end. And this is all this sort of stack of turtle stuff that we see over and over again in the cloud, where there's all these different pieces owned by different folks, and you've got to get them all to kind of click together nicely. Yeah, that's why I think uh, um, uh, initiatives like Cloud Foundry makes it attractive for enterprises, so they get to um, they get more control over uh, uh, what they, where where the, uh, the developers can put their data and things like that. So I think uh, that's why uh, Cloud Foundry is attractive for me. Okay. So when we start talking about how to educate the developers. It's more, I mean, it, the, the big question is, then becomes, is okay, do we now have to go, I mean, for example, when I started doing programming many, many, many years ago, I got gray hair and all that, so using weird languages that a lot of people don't use today, we actually went through a very structured analysis, very structured programming, very structured code reviews, and eventually we, finished, we came out with a product. But everything's gone so fast, and what PASS provides me is yet another way to go even faster. That a lot of these steps that we used to take are, are dropping off the wayside, dropping by the wayside, in the order of oh, if I don't have some, I don't have the newest groovy thing this week, we're going to be out of business. And I get that from a lot of people. So the developers are there, are, are saying, don't put anything in my way that'll slow me down. Well, yeah, and it, this is the this is the the trade off of DevOps is if you take on ops responsibility, you take on ops responsibility. Um, and so I, I I absolutely hear what you're saying, and I think this this sort of that the big part of this education very much is about um, about the developer understanding that um, if they actually want to um to control the life of the application in the deployed cloud environment that they they're taking on a certain level of responsibility themselves that they have to manage and maintain or they have to find something that manages and maintains it if there's a formal ops organization that takes control of the application once it's deployed then then the developer can still sort of hand off a certain level of security responsibility to that but as you said so much of it is code level security that um that really you know it it, it kind of comes down to the fact that i think the, you you have to just make it extremely clear that the liability for the security of the application rests with those that have control over that, and that's the developer and the platform is the service environment. But today in an enterprise, developers do not have that responsibility. I hear you. I think you're exactly right. The operations team, for the most part, in one sense or another, even though security isn't always lumped in with 100% with them, um, Operations, but the operations team tends to have most of that responsibility, and 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 I agree with you that you have, you now have a situation where developers are taking on things that uh, they didn't have to deal with before, and the and the the leaders in this space, the 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 um, the, the first you know pioneer um, users of platform as a service department have either done relatively low security elements, or they they have discovered that. You know, they've discovered that in the hard way. Folks building Facebook apps on um, App Engine, you can, if you go look at the App Engine Twitter stream, maybe not so much anymore, but but certainly six six months or a year ago, you saw a tremendous number of messages about, you know, how do I make sure that uh, that X, Y, or Z is going to be encrypted correctly? I, I think I agree, James. It's a more of a generational thing. If you see those young developers going 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 into startups, they understand it, they get it. But uh, probably it's the, the we need to educate the enterprise developers more than these young developers who go into startups and they start with the let's say Heroku or one of the one of those uh, past solutions uh, for their uh, needs. So I think uh, it could be a generational thing too. But do they get it? That's the big question. I mean, I know Facebook uh, developers I, I like, uh, tend to think like, they get it, lot, but there's so many problems. 
a large chunk of these developers get it. Like, I, 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 I talk to these developers in the meetups and stuff like that. A large chunk of them get it. But, uh, still, there are some who, who don't get it, but uh, a large chunk of them uh, who, who, who have grown into the cloud, cloud age, they get it. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that I think that those that are growing into cloud or those that are seeing cloud as an opportunity to shake the shackles of a past experience, I think I think they do get it. I think they understand that they're taking on a lot more. For, for instance, just to, just as a, as a parallel, they know they're taking on a lot more in terms of reliability. They're ta- know they're taking a lot on a lot more in terms of scalability. Um, in terms of uh, you know a, a variety of those other cap- those the other capabilities that we used to rely on the, on the hardware to do for us, um, well, are they or are, are you basically saying is this really a is the pat the platform itself taking on a lot more for reliability and a lot more for availability a lot more for redundancy so the no, developer I I... just codes the environment and inherits all that because if you look at if you look at um, um, v fabric and all that that's exactly what you do get if you look at cloud foundry uh, i mean sorry v fabric cloud foundry that's what you get if you look at force it's exactly what you get you don't have to worry about it no you, but, you do have to worry about some of that stuff so because you have to build to a framework that takes care of that for you, right? So you have to build to an architecture. You have to understand how you can and cannot use that architecture in order to take advantage of that capability. So uh, again, when I, you know, was was when I was carefully watching the, the conversation going on among uh, App Engine developers for a while. I mean, the, 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 that was a big topic of conversation. Was you know, how do you correctly um, architect an application to the framework to take advantage then of the capability that's automated for them? But they they had to be concerned about how do you split data out? How do you cache and, and you know and and deal with those kinds of issues or or make sure that Google caches for you? Um how do you take care of um uh you know that how big um a grant how big granularity should you have for um the different service elements inside your application that uh, that you needed to deploy? Um what kind of message patterns did you want, you know, did was it okay to have a whole bunch of small messages that you passed back and forth or did you do one big message? How do you keep well, your transaction standard, loads low? But that's and, that's standard that's standard performance issues. Most but, but developers no, but, don't I know mean, how to do that. Well, but I, I think most enterprise developers in fact I would argue didn't know how to do that to a web scale in the past. They just you know, they they just developed to a scale that allowed them to at least vertically scale. Um, and they they developed a situation where you know if there was hardware redundancy it would take care of any problems for them and they they really didn't put that into the application or into any kind of automation around the operations of the application that's one of the fundamental revolutions that's going on here with cloud is that developers are even though we've known how to do this for ten fifteen twenty years right they're now being forced to do it right in these contexts and when you talk to the folks that have actually done large scale deployments in a cloud model. They will tell you that there is a whole philosophy and a whole approach towards application development that you have to take on, and that carries over to platform as a service. Um, another great community to watch. Oh, 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 see. Before you well, get onto that, we've got a few other cups. I mean, Michael and, and even want to. Yeah, get I'm sorry. Right. Word in right. I just want to say Azure's the other one to watch in that category. But go ahead. Okay, Michael, you All first. Right. What I was going to talk about here was, uh, and this is now you guys have moved past my first point, but I'll try to catch up. <laughs> so we had an out- we had an outage at Amazon, right? And we had some users who, you know, basically went down, down, down. I think Reddit was one of them. Were completely unavailable during the the availability problem that Amazon had. Uh, Netflix carried on because they had subscribed to multiple availability regions. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that, and I've run into this before, right? I I I want uh, a while back I was an acting CISO for a very large company. And some marketing folks went out and bought some services from a cloud provider, and they bought the cheapest service. And the cheapest service was, of course, without security, and they got hacked in the cloud, and bad things ensued, and we had to change the whole process so that security people got involved uh, on the acquisition side. But what I'm getting at is that not all consumers know what to ask for. Not all developers know how to do secure coding. I'll say very few do. Um, I'm sorry to be pessimistic about this. And perhaps there's an opportunity as well. So when we start talking about this kind of a situation we're moving to with the cloud, and the cloud is evolving, the cloud is maturing, we have an opportunity to start saying, well, 
I'm going to give you this language platform to develop in the cloud. And in this language platform, buffer overflow is impossible. Let's just, let's just pick one problem. You know, if I, could, if I could do that, then, you know, overnight, 10 years of programming mistakes would disappear. Yeah, but we all know uh, there is no such language. That, that's not true, Edward. Uh, <laughs> I, could give you a, I could give you a platform where SQL injection is impossible, right? Uh, if I chose to, I could build such a platform. Would that platform be the cheapest platform? No yeah. effing way. But nor would I, nor would it necessarily be the most flexible platform, right? Well, that's there is the rub, right? But uh, on the other hand, I could also give you a platform where, in part of my service, I run automated uh, web security checks for you, and I find that you've got an SQL injection, or I find the ten most common ones because automation is not perfect. But at least I do that much, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things we can do, you know. If, if we're talking about like a VMForce or Force.com or something from VMware based in Spring, right, then I can start customizing the Spring platform or adding on to the Spring platform, you know, automated security checks or automated uh, good code, uh, code security practice checks, you know, right in the development process. Which would be actually a very nice tool to have. And there's a few of those out there, but not for every language, which is unfortunate. Right, but if the cloud platform is a big enough platform for a language, then there becomes an incentive to, to develop that. Yeah. So even you were going to say something? Right, uh, I think it's uh, right, right on mark on uh, that. Like the the, 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 the related marketplace which I spoke about, that's what I meant. Like uh, you, uh, it opens up uh, opportunities to uh, build these kind of platforms, like uh, suited for a niche uh, the set of uh, developers. So probably. Uh, we will have a, a varied uh, set of uh, platforms available, and we can pick and choose what we want based on the based on our needs. I think that's where we'll finally end up. Okay. Yep. So I was just going to add, uh, as I was listening, that it seems the DevOps model. I'm glad you brought that up because that's a big movement that we see happening, and cloud is enabling a developer to bypass IT and set up whatever prototype of whatever application they want out there in the cloud. And what, what's sad is that what's happening is then they promote that prototype to a production machine. And it's unfortunate that the cloud providers don't offer the security controls that are needed for production machines. A lot of times, depending on the class of data uh, that's in there, is the level of security controls that you need. So obviously in QA, you're just testing with garbage data. But once you get production data in there, then you've got to have these security controls in place. Well, I mean, if you think about it, Thinking about that way, you know, if I'm a pass provider, let's say I'm just a standard enterprise and I put a, a platform as a service into my enterprise, okay? So I let my developers get a taste of it, but it's not really in the cloud. It's just a platform out there that they can program to. Case in point, WordPress or anything like that. That's something I can pull internally. It is a platform I can program to it. it That's a great it, example. It uses PHP. I mean, but... Everything I add into it has its own, I mean, is it going to go through security review? Probably not. Am I going to be using live data for my testing? Probably. You know, I'm going to start rapidly developing stuff, but I'm now in my bastion. So data loss prevention, uh, probably not a big issue. How does authentication happen or user provisioning? Exactly. Well, that's another question that we have to answer. I mean, we got, that's a big problem as well. It's fine, like I said, it's perfectly fine for development environments, but once you make it, once you open it up to the world and it, you start having uh, people in your company go on there, we need to uh, offer security controls that you would have in a traditional enterprise. Well, at that time, remember, passes are there to allow us to build those SaaS apps. So then we go to software, uh, software as a service, which has its own intrinsic issues, and we haven't talked about that one on the podcast yet. Yeah, but I heard I heard the the talker saying that um, platform as a service don't worry too much about security because that's the customer's responsibility. Maybe oh. I misunderstood it. No, that that wasn't so much. The the point was that until the tech. At least my point was until the technology gets caught up 
to um, the point where that we understand what security we can introduce as a part of the platform, and again, we're very, very baby steps right now. Then, then, then you know, as it, it is the end user's responsibility today to deal with what those security issues are, um, and we have some iterations of of products to get introduced to the market to begin to move the industry to the point where that security is built much more into the baseline of what the underlying platform delivers. Um, but, you know, and I don't know that I necessarily agree that um, that it's great for development, but not for production in all cases. I think there are certainly situations where security is a critical concern, where that is 100% true. But I think there are other types of applications out there that people are delivering um, you know, consumer level apps that don't really connect, collect that much really personal information. For instance, uh, you know, Facebook games, Twitter, uh, Twitter client kind of things, or Twitter um, data processing kind of apps, those kinds of things where they're perfect for production. And, um, and so then the question is, how do we evolve from those types of really simplistic apps and baseline need apps unless, to more sophisticated apps? Unless those apps allow people to break the, to break the platforms upon which they're done. So for a Facebook game, for example, could be used to hack the system. It's been done in the past. It'll probably be done again in the future. So then that becomes an issue. Sure. And uh, you know, there's something. There's no way the platform provider is going to kill every potential security concern. For instance, I can, you know, if I have a wonderfully secure environment, I could probably write a really, really powerful phishing application, right? That uh, would be really, really hard to 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 break down and stop. So. Thank you. Um, so there's no way to cover it all. Go ahead, Chris. What are you going to say? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with them. Like, uh, so it's always a uh, balance between security and uh, convenience. So, like, um, no, 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 no platform provider is going to be all secure. And, um, and uh, similarly, uh, we, we don't have a com completely secure uh, environment in the traditional enterprises. So, like, uh, I think it's, it's, it all depends on uh, what your security needs. And uh, you just push those apps. Uh, which, uh, which are good enough to be on a uh, past, uh, platform. So uh, what we, people should take out of this is that you know your security needs for everything you're doing in the platform, which uh, know your security needs of the application, know your security needs of the data, and choose a platform appropriately. Exactly. That's it. Yeah, and this, the problem is that DevOps guys don't really have that uh, background, so we need to do a better job of educating the That's developers. Good. Yes, well, I agree the, other, the other point I'll make, because I learned this at a, a painful experience, is you've got if you're the security guy in a company, and you you know this may be going on at your company, probably is going on at your company. You need to find your way into these conversations because you know even the developer with the best of intentions may not have the background to ask the right questions or to even know that a question needs to be asked, right? And you know what I found was that I had to in order to cover you know, this particular enterprise globally, I actually had to go in through with purchasing and make this part of purchasing process and purchasing language uh, for the corporation so that uh, the provider, right, the third party service provider, either had to assume liability or through the negotiation of fee for service and provisioning, you know, work with the members of the security team to to get these these very sometimes very difficult questions answered. And not only that, so you got you got education necessary for the developers for anybody using the platform, whether it be a developer or a user. And you need to have anybody that's trying to do development operations or DevOps they need to understand the security concerns as well. They can't. They, matter of fact, security should be part of any of those discussions. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't want to be a pest, but I want to emphasize once again that uh, transparency from the provider side is vital, and they have to do, work with, the, with some of the initiatives like cloud audit and uh, get people to trust them. That's very vital. Well, that would be nice, Krish. I don't see it happening. Yeah. Amazon <laughs> and Google have quite plainly said they're never going to tell anybody what they do inside. Yeah, well, uh, that, that, that's why like, I've been highlighting this in every possible opportunity because the market pressure is the only way to get those guys come down and really open up. So let's try to do in, a grass, in some sort of a grassroots way and uh, pressure these guys to uh, open up. 
six more. And again, I think that, I think Chris has hit the nail on the head, right? Again, so early on that it looks kind of bleak right now. But the truth of the matter is, is either either security will be a critical requirement of applications that are deployed in the platform and the service world, in which case I think transparency has to happen. And in fact, to, to the point of it not happening at all, I mean, some of the application down folks are in fact taking advantage of these things, and you know, to the extent that they can. So, and Stratus um, exposes cloud audit information. Um, I believe RightScale has been working on that as well. Um, and, and the problem is, is really kind of getting to the point where um, where the demand for that capability is such that that the vendors have to respond to it. And and I believe, you know, I think along with Chris, that as the the pass market um, evolves and there are more federated capabilities and and, and sort of more more enticement to join into the pass environment, that these security things are gonna are gonna actually have to be addressed. In the meantime, I think we're looking at a couple of years anyway, where um, where the security situation will be will be, you know, you have to figure out what you can do with that platform and whether it meets your needs. Okay. So right now you have to make that decision, and also you need to pay attention to educating the developers, development ops. You need to work with the providers to get some sort of auditing capability in the past platform for security or an automated tool to tell you, yep, everything checks out, let's go on. Or perhaps if we're stuck on only one language, an automated tool is say, hey, that's an insecure construct, change it. And don't let it run, which could actually happen for some languages. Mm -hmm. And I think the last one is, is that I think whoever uses the platform needs to be aware that security is their concern. I don't care if it's the CEO or the developer. They all have to be part of that discussion about security. Uh, have I covered everything we talked about? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have a few minutes left in the podcast, so if you guys um, have any last thoughts, Michael? Um, I think we covered that. I was just going to say that there's been a recent document that came out, the uh, version two guidance from PCI around virtualization, and they have made a clear division for infrastructure service platform and software as a service in that document. And although it's just a representative, it does help people understand where they have to separate provider and subscriber responsibility. And again, I think that's the key here that for Consumers of the cloud who are adopting one of these cloud models, you have to understand where your responsibility lies for protecting the data and whether or not your, your provider offers any protection or any assumption of that liability. Most providers are going to do everything they can to avoid any liability for protecting your data. So it's all going to be incumbent on the subscriber. Okay. Steven, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, I got in late. Um, so sorry about that. As far as adding anything to the conversation, I'd like to see more security controls embedded into the offerings from the cloud providers. It should be a checkbox you can get, just like uh, having a backup of your environment. Um, you should be able to ask for a stronger authentication or external logging to external providers, et cetera. Okay, so more controls that are more dials and knobs on the options available, even if you have to pay for it. Like there should be a free service that you can get, which many people are taking advantage of. And then um, I like the idea that Google has with a lot of different uh, providers that add extra functionality to uh, what Google has. They'll have a free version and then they'll have a paid service that you can use. So that's one of the nice things Platform as a Service offers, but we need some better guidance and training for the DevOps people to uh, know how to use those and which ones are recommended. Sort of a trust or reputation system for that. Okay. Um, Krish, do you have anything? Uh, uh, um, uh, unlike the traditional computing days, like uh, users now have more awareness about their rights as a customer in the marketplace. And I hope uh, vendors understand this and sort of self-regulate and enforce uh, and uh, be more transparent. If it doesn't happen, the last resort is common stepping in and ensuring that there is some level of transparency from the vendor side. So we want transparency all the way down. Yeah. Okay. And James, do you have anything to add? 
Uh, I said a lot already, but I will say that, um, you know, I think the key here is to understand we're really early in the game. I think there's an awful lot still happening on infrastructure as a service as well that um, that may enable the platform as a service vendors to do more um, with less effort. Um, and I think that the, the sort of early standards efforts out of the Cloud Security Alliance, um, out of some of the other um, elements that are working on things are going to begin to contribute to, to that story as well. Also on, on the identity side, some of the identity standards as well. Um, and so I, I look to the next two to three years as being really, really fast moving. Um, uh, and to say for that long of a time frame that it'll be fast moving is I think actually really impressive, but there'll be a tremendous amount of, of innovation and standardization, de facto standardization that's going to begin to happen in that time frame. And the picture a year from now will be drastically different. The picture three years from now will be, I think, one that most enterprises will get very comfortable about where PASS fits into their um, their overall strategy and uh, how they can get the levels of security they need for certain classes of applications for PASS. Okay. Well, my last thoughts are just to state that really, right, at this time, security really is the business of the people working in the cloud, whether it be infrastructure, software, or PASS. It's not the cloud provider. It's your responsibility. As for where we are in two to three years, I kind of agree, but I actually think two to three years, maybe even four years from now, the SAPs of the world are going to actually have platforms. So that people like, I mean, and Oracle will have a platform, so PeopleSoft and so forth can be written on top of and added to on top of it. So they would actually be cloud-based applications built on some form of platform. But I expect true cloud applications be coming out, enterprise cloud applications in two to three years anyway. Yeah. I, I actually, I agree with that, Edward, completely. And some other podcast sometime, I, I, we, it'd be a, a brilliant topic to talk about alone, um, just about you know the evolution of PaaS with respect to, um, to um, where it will show up with respect to other types of services. Okay, and uh, the, at the moment it's like, it's also, I mean, you can't go too fast. This stuff is really new. There isn't a lot of thought on the security side. And if you are going to use it, make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you know what you're buying and biting into. And do the audits, do the code reviews. I still think those are, are going to be necessary, even though we're moving towards this faster and faster and faster development cycle. So that is the end of the Virtualization Security Podcast number 62. I'd like to thank our, de our guest, James Urquhart. I probably messed that up again. I'm sorry, James. That's all right. Don't worry about it. And, and Krishna has joined us as well. I thank you, gentlemen, for joining us and all of our regulars. Have a great weekend. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye-bye.